podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here. Thanks for joining us this week on the show. A New York Times bestselling author who wrote a book. It's interesting. So when we set up this interview, they, they send us books in advance oftentimes. And I'm looking at the book and I'm like, I recognize this name, you know, and uh, and so then as I'm doing some some research for the interview, I realized this guy wrote a book previously that I really enjoyed. It's called When Genius Failed, and it's about the long term capital management company, the disaster that happened with them. Not sure if you're familiar. Um, I, you know, kind of a finance geek having having done that for a while, but that was a great book. And so then I got extra excited for a topic I I wasn't quite sure about. And so we're interviewing Roger Lowenstein, um, well-known writer. He's written a lot of best-selling books. And his newest one, which drops literally today, uh, you're probably listening to this, I'm not sure, but the 20th of October, is called America's Bank, The Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve. So you might be going, uh, why do I want to read about that? You might not. You might think that's great. The thing is, in this interview specifically, we we touch on the book, but we also talk about, you know, what role does the Federal Reserve play? Why is it that a hundred years ago, we were the only industrialized nation not to have a central bank? And then the reasons we were scared of that are actually resurfacing today with a lot of the centralization of power in the financial industry and in banks. We also talk about, you know, being a reporter or a journalist, how do you go about doing the research for a historical book such as this or for something more recent? So when he did his book on long-term capital management or on Warren Buffett, how do you kind of do the research for that? It's always cool to dig into the minds of those who have succeeded at the highest level of their industry. And so it was fun to talk to Roger before we get into the book. As always, just wanted to let you guys know where to find us specifically head on over to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Sign up for the newsletter. We're doing some interesting things there. One of them being, I think we're going to start releasing episodes just to those signed up for the newsletter. Maybe they're kind of niche episodes. Maybe it's just John and I kind of discussing what we've learned Or, you know, I'm even thinking the second interview with Roger, we might release just through the newsletter. And that's on top of other things we send out, such as giveaways, updates, interesting articles, life-changing knowledge, all that good stuff. Smartpeoplepodcast.com, number of ways to sign up for the newsletter on the homepage, bottom right-hand side. All right. As always, thanks for joining us. Tell a friend. That's really how we grow the most, word of mouth. We are turning it over here to Roger Lowenstein as we talk about his brand new book, America's Bank, The Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve. Enjoy. As we've been discussing this and you're talking about the project and the historical nature, the letters, of course, we're talking about your your brand new book, America's Bank, The Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve, which comes out October 20th, um, which will be the date of the release of this show. So let's jump into that. I wanted to start off with asking you, A, what is the Federal Reserve? And B, why write about it? Well... You know, if you have a wallet on you right now, Chris, and you were to take out uh, a piece of, you know, a piece of that green paper that you carry around, I'm doing it right now, <laughs> uh, and it's a, it's a Washington, it's a one, and it says, you know, it's got ones in the four corners, and it's got a serial number, uh, you know, to, to track it, uh, and it's got, uh, you know, a signature, uh, 
from this one's Tim Geithner. So, uh, you know, it's a series 2009 when Timothy Geithner was secretary treasurer. But the Treasury didn't issue this note. Uh, it's issued by, it's a Federal Reserve note. So um, the, this, this dollar comes from the Federal Reserve. And um, you know, that sort of raises the question, well, how do they make it? How much do they make it of it? How do they decide how to circulate it? You know, I think we all had the question in maybe second or third grade, it occurred to us, money's so great. Uh, no one seems to have as much of it as they like. Why don't they just print more of it? You know, I mean, it's not it's not like an automobile where you need, you know, a thousand people in a factory to make it. And it takes time you know, everything. And 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 this gives rise to all sorts of questions. How if you can't just print it endlessly, uh, how much of it um, should you print? And what happens if people run out of it? Is it OK to start circulating it then? And if you do, uh, will it still be valuable? Will people, um, you know, go to something else, wampum or gold or beads or whatever? And it it turns out that this question has uh, puzzled, uh, distracted, uh, obsessed, and intrigued um, uh, people around the world, and most particularly in this country, uh, really since the beginning. You know, we had this. Um, uh, experience with uh, Continentals, not worth a Continental, which was the, you know, the, the various coins issued by um, uh, colonies and, you know, that became states in the, in the Revolutionary War uh, period. And um, we had um, two experiments with uh, uh, prototype Federal Reserves very early in our history. And uh, both of them were uh, quickly abandoned uh, for reasons I'll get into. Uh, and when we came to into the 20th century in this country, uh, the U.S. by then was uh, really a, you know, a very strong industrialized nation. We weren't quite the leader uh, in the world's economy the way uh, we would be viewed as uh, today, but we were certainly a very developed and advanced industrialized nation. But we lacked one thing, quite strangely. We were the only uh, country in the world that still didn't have a central bank uh, issuing uh, notes and deciding how much of this paper currency uh, to circulate and so forth. And um, uh, that was because in the U.S. there was a uh, very, uh, very long and traditional fear of things that I, I think will seem uh, very resonant to readers today and listeners today. People were afraid of big banks. They didn't uh, trust big banks. Uh, they thought that big banks, like a big central bank, would uh, mostly work to favor the rich and not ordinary people. Huh, and, sounds uh, familiar. <laughs> sounds familiar. And they didn't trust big government. Right. Uh, they didn't trust the federal government. Well, and I... Well, they I, figured, I, I'll, just, I'll just say, let me just add sure, that. Sure, sure. So to them, a big government bank combined, um, uh, you know, the most, the, the scariest part of two worlds. It was government. It was big and it was a bank. Right. And whereas in England and in France and in the Netherlands and in Russia uh, and on and on, this seemed like a, a very routine operation to have a bank uh, in the center of things uh, distributing the money and being a lender to private banks. In the U.S., we didn't have one and it had uh, very disastrous consequences. And uh, the, the struggle... Uh, to change that was quite dramatic, and, and uh, I thought it would make a, a very interesting tale. Yeah, and and it, you know, I I want to get into that because that fear, I think, of centralization and kind of combining government with finances is, is really relevant today. And I understand it's perfect timing for your book, but I still want to cover a little bit more because I think there might be more to the Fed that I still don't understand or listeners might not understand. So, I mean, primarily the goal is to determine the amount of capital or, or, or cash, I guess, um, in a country. Well, uh, there's, there's several goals. Let's talk about another very important one that I think will resonate today, which is lender of last resort. Exactly. So yep. Let's talk for a second about an ordinary bank. Not a central bank, just an ordinary bank. Why does that exist? That exists because uh, at some points you may have extra cash and uh, not know what to do with it. 
And at some points, I may have not enough cash and not have uh, a vehicle for getting it. And so a bank exists to uh, borrow from people like you who have cash to lend and lend to people like me uh, who need to borrow. Because otherwise, how would we find each other, right? And so a bank pools the, the surplus reserves, if you will, of everybody in the community and then lends them out uh, to people who need those reserves. And, and if you think about it from society's point of view, it's a way of transferring capital from people who can't use it at the moment to people who do have a use for it. So, you know, banks serve a real function. Well, it turns out that uh, banks uh, on occasion also need banks. There are banks that have uh, more reserves than they need and would like to lend them. And there are banks that um, don't have enough reserves at time and need to borrow them. A central bank is a banker to banks. It acts as the uh, the lender of last resort and the pool of reserves for all of the banks in the country, just as one bank acts for all the people in a community. Um, and that gets a little more interesting when we recall that in, in financial markets, we can have things called panics, right? Financial markets are different. No one really says, I'm not going to buy a car because nobody else is buying a car today. People just don't act that way. If you need a car, you're going to buy a car. You know, you're, you really don't care if other people are buying a car that day. But we know that finance isn't like that. Every so often, people get nervous about the money in the bank and run to take it out of the bank. In modern times, it might not be a conventional bank account. It might be the types of securities that people sold when Lehman Brothers failed. But it's the same idea. When everybody runs to take their money out of one bank, typically they start getting afraid about what will happen to other banks. And they start taking their money out of the other banks. And you can get every bank in the community uh, short on cash and, and even failing. And that's another reason why, uh, and that was really one of the main reasons, uh, countries developed central banks, was to have someone to lend uh, when other banks all needed to borrow. A lender of last resort, or uh, as the expression was, someone to lean into the wind when others were leaning against it to provide cash when everybody else was uh, scarce. And, you know, we saw the Federal Reserve play that role, obviously, repeatedly and dramatically in 2008. And nobody likes the bailouts. Nobody likes that they help banks, all of that. But uh, nobody liked it. You have to remember how really bad it was when the economy was collapsing, when unemployment was going up from 5% to 8 to 10 to 10 and a half. And companies were failing, you know, major companies were failing every week. Uh, most of us would say that it was a good thing that the Federal Reserve existed to come in and start lending when nobody else was lending. All right, it's that time where we take a break. And this time, we're doing it a little differently. You see, a listener of ours reached out and said, hey, I'm starting an incredible company, and I'd like to sponsor one of your episodes to make your listeners aware. And when he told me what he did, I said, you know what? First, I'd love to, to talk to you. Let's, let's get on the phone. Let's record it. And maybe we'll use that for the spot. And so here's a clip from my conversation with the co-founder of the new subscription seafood company, Northern Catch. His name is Garrett McKinney. So Northern Catch is a subscription seafood service. So the idea is that someone will subscribe. And we will send four pounds or more of sustainable wild Alaskan seafood to your doorstep. How much of your mission, the reason you started this, is also due to the sustainability? Is it more sustainable? Both me and Teddy used to commercial fish in Alaska. And so we've seen every different aspect of, of how Alaskan seafood operates. And something that's so valuable about Alaska is that the people who fish really care about being able to do that the rest of their life. So sustainability is, is really a part of what we want to, to give people because when you, when you go to the grocery store and you pull a bag of, of fish out of the freezer, um, you don't always know where that came from. The traceability factor isn't there. And that's where we always want to make sure people know exactly where the fish came, it came from as well as that it's certified sustainable. What is included? What are some examples of what's included in your boxes? So the box will contain what's ever in season and, and the best catch we can get for that month. So that could be salmon, uh, king crab, but it could also be things like black cod or true cod. There's also some delicious shrimp we have in Alaska as well as scallops. 
So it could rotate between all these different things depending on what's best available for that month. All right, guys. Well, why don't you leave the fishing to the experts at Northern Catch and sign up to have the best sustainable seafood in the world shipped straight to your door. All you have to do is head to northerncatch.fish. Yep, you heard that right. It's northerncatch.fish and donate $10 to Alaskan Fisheries Conservation. This will reserve a Captain's Club membership for you that gets you $50 off your first order of sustainable Alaskan seafood. Let's get back to this episode. Well, so do they lend from, do they have a, uh, a stockpile or when they need to lend, is that when they print? Well, for instance, lending can take several forms. It can take the form of going to the bank and they giving you a check or cash. It can take the form of buying a bond, right? If I, if I sell you uh, a bond or a security, uh, I'm giving you a piece of paper and you're giving me cash. And the Federal Reserve was buying uh, truckloads of um, uh, securities backed by um, home mortgages, securities backed by corporate commercial paper, which meant it was lending to people like General Electric and so on, securities backed by auto loans. It was lending uh, in huge, billions and billions to banks themselves so that the banks could turn around. And instead of saying to their customers, sorry, we got nothing to lend to you, uh, and maybe even sorry, we can't even let you take your deposits back, suddenly the banks did have cash. So they were lending um, uh, really through every vehicle they could. But that and, lending, and, the, the cash that they're using, is it coming from a stockpile or did they have to print to, to then lend on that note, whatever it might be? They create a reserve. If they buy a, um, a security, say, from a bank, uh, they uh, create a notation. The, the, the bank then has a notation in a Federal Reserve account and it can withdraw that in the form of cash whenever it wants. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so that function, let me switch back now. I mean, so that, that fun, we, we've lived through that function and saw how uh, crucial it was uh, to resuscitating the economy. And then although the economy is not gangbusters today, uh, it's obviously a lot better than it was in 2008. Unemployment is 5%, not 10%. The economy is growing, not shrinking. Uh, companies aren't failing left and right. In Go back 100 years ago, uh, and because of this uh, deep-seated and uh, very American uh, fear of centralization, big banks, all that, there was no lender of last resort. And something kind of funny would happen. So banks had reserves then. They had spare capital, and they kept them in the vault. Or sometimes they deposited them in other banks, typically banks in the countryside, would deposit their spare cash in the city. Not surprisingly, uh, city banks paid higher interest rates. Banks in the city could lend to corporations, make a little more money. So money tended to get attracted into the cities. However, every fall, like clockwork, they would need cash in the countryside. Why would they need cash? Because it was harvest time. They'd have to pay farmhands. They'd have to buy fuel for tractors. You know, the harvest takes money. Cash would then drain out of the cities, and there'd be a mini depression virtually every fall. Sometimes that mini depression would uh, escalate into a major depression. We had frequent uh, episodes where the cities just ran out of cash and frequent depressions. There was no balancing wheel to say, um, okay, the countryside needs a little more cash, so we better lend or lend it back into the cities and smooth this out. You know, for, for what was then a pretty developed country, it was a highly unsophisticated and primitive financial system. And um, one of the heroes of the book, a German-born financier, a fellow named Paul Warburg, had emigrated to the U.S. Uh, to join, uh, he married an American, and joined his in-laws bank, an investment bank called Kuhn Loeb. And he was startled to see this uh, periodic seasonal uh, bout of uh, money panics. People would run to the banks then. The banks would be scarce. And what happens when people run to the banks? Uh, banks run out of cash and they stop lending. And that exactly, you know, you can just then see it builds on itself. Everybody pulls in their horns and it grows on itself. And he took a look around and said, how come there's no lender of last resort uh, in this country? 
And uh, uh, his uh, in-laws, who were American and knew the system, said, don't, don't talk about that. Warburg actually wrote a paper where he recommended, this is back in 1902, that the U.S. form something like the Reichsbank, which was a German central bank that he'd grown up with, or the Bank of England, the Bank of France. And uh, his, uh, his brother-in-law said, don't show that to anybody uh, because uh, uh, it, it, you'll, it, you'll, you'll engender hostility. It, it, as a newcomer, people won't want to hear you talking about a central bank. It's a very touchy subject in this country. But just as a teaching experiment, uh, uh, his in-law showed the paper to uh, a guy named Stillman, who was uh, ran uh, Citibank, the forerunner of today's uh, uh, Citigroup, and said, let's, let's see what he says. And uh, uh, so this guy, Stillman, is really the head of the New York banking fraternity. And a few days later, Warburg looks up from his desk, and there's Stillman uh, towering over him. And uh, Stillman says to him, uh, somewhat sardonically, uh, how's the great international financier? And uh, uh, then he adds, don't you think that Citibank's doing rather well, Warburg? Warburg says, yes, very well. Stillman says, so why not leave well enough alone? And uh, Warburg says, when the next panic comes, uh, you'll wish that uh, you weren't so prominent in the system because of the responsibility that will be thrust on you. Stillman walks away in a huff. And uh, sure enough, several years later, the country experiences a terrific panic, the panic of 1907. And Stillman's bank, uh, the, the city bank of, uh, uh, of New York, uh, is right in the thick of it. They are called on to rescue uh, bank after bank. And in the middle of the panic, uh, Warburg looks up and he sees uh, Stillman there. And Stillman says, where's your paper, Warburg? Huh. And the story takes off from there. Well, what's interesting about that is, you know, because initially when when you were talking about this one gentleman, I'm thinking, man, times must have been different that one guy can disrupt such a large system. But really, it's right man, right spot, because he had the connections to someone who could actually do something about it. Is that correct? Well, it took enormous work, enormous uh, study, uh, writing, uh, propagandizing, lobbying. Uh, people did not want uh, to hear this. Uh, Warburg really became a crusader for a central bank. People didn't want to hear it. Uh, his next um, target, so to speak, was a very powerful U.S. senator from Rhode Island, a man named uh, Nelson Aldrich, who uh, he was sort of a, uh, you know, when Mark Twain wrote about we have the best Senate that money can buy, he might have had uh, Nelson Aldrich in mind. Uh, he was heavily supported by companies in whose interests he legislated, the sugar lobby uh, the railroads and so on, and, and uh, Aldrich was uh, fabulously rich and, and, and too rich, really, for a U.S. senator. Uh, has a fabulous mansion overlooking uh, Narragansett Bay uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, he he was uh, his particular interest was the tariff, and he kept the sugar tariff extremely high to, to please the sugar lobby. And all this made him very rich. He was um, as a progressive movement. Uh, developed in the early 1900s, uh, he became um, really an anti-hero, but he was very powerful. And uh, he was chairman of the Senate Banking Committee. And Warburg convinced Aldrich to at least study the American system. And in, uh, in 1908, uh, Aldrich led uh, an expedition to Europe. And they went to, uh, uh, it was sort of a blue ribbon panel. There were 18 senators and congressmen on it. And we have these all the time in this country. We have a problem that seems either intractable or that no one really wants to deal with. So they say, we'll appoint a commission, right? And you know, whether it's Social Security or uh, what to do about uh, gun violence uh, or um, the budget deficit, uh, you know, these things where there are interests on all sides and no one wants to make a tough choice, what do we do? We appoint a commission. So that's what they did in 1907. After the panic, they appointed a commission. And because Aldrich was the head of it, uh, and was basically a fixer. They figured nothing would happen, but Aldrich kind of got the bug, the bug of curiosity in him. And he hired a Harvard professor uh, to, uh, to uh, educate the commission. 
he um, enlisted some 40 different scholars to develop uh, books on the history and practices of banking in the U.S. and in different countries with different systems around the world. And then he led this mission to Europe. And uh, they sat down with uh, bankers and with central bankers in, uh, in London, in Paris, in Berlin. Uh, he rummaged through old books shops in London, reading about the history of central banking in England. They went to a few operas too and, and had some nice dinners. And, you know, they were in Europe. Uh, things moved to more leisurely pace then. But uh, in each of these capitals, there came a moment when they would ask uh, an official at, at the Banque de France or at the Reichsbank or the Bank of England, what happens when you get a money shortage? What happens when you get a panic? What happens when there's some lack of confidence? And each time, uh, the gentleman in question would say, it, it just doesn't happen because the the, the people know that each of these banks can always turn to the central bank uh, for an emergency loan, for a loan of last resort, and we don't have these sorts of panics. And, you know, he was a little bit like Paul on the road to Damascus. Aldrich saw the light and came back and decided that um, he would now work for um, a central bank as well. And now a quick word from one of this week's sponsors. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash smart people. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash smart people. lynda.com is for the problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to master Excel, learn negotiation tactics, build a website, or boost your Photoshop skills. Go to lynda.com and feed your curious mind. Some of the courses that I recommend this week are Growth Hacking Fundamentals, Getting Things Done, and Bootstrapping Your Business. Personally, I've been enjoying the Responsive Design Fundamentals with James Williamson. When you think about it, every website and web project has to work across multiple devices now. Not just desktop computers, not just laptop computers, but also smartphones. And in this course, you learn about what responsive design is, how to utilize it using HTML, CSS. It's absolutely phenomenal. The videos are great. Explanations are great. I highly recommend you try it out. With a lynda.com membership, you can watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching. You can also learn at your own pace. Courses are structured so you can watch them from start to finish or consume them in bite-sized pieces. So listen up. Your lynda.com membership will give you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an industry expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to visit lynda.com slash smart people and sign up for your free 10 day trial. That's L Y N D A dot com slash S M A R T P E O P L E. Lynda.com slash smart people. Okay, so they, they make this decision, but really a lot of it has to come down to convincing the American people. So the, the effort to convince the American people was arduous and long. Uh, it was uh, there were sleights of hand and, and um, I'd say uh, instances of deceptive marketing, uh, in particular by Warburg. Warburg uh, formed something called the National uh, Citizens Commission uh, to um, sort of be a front organization uh, to give the appearance that uh, citizens around were clamoring for a central bank. Um, and, you know, this was nonsense. I mean, the average citizen then is now, um, you know, wasn't a banking specialist, much less a monetary specialist. And uh, he insisted that these, uh, that this organization have chapters all around the country, that it not be run from New York because you know, New York meant bankers, Wall Street, bad stuff, all that. And um, uh, they uh, filled this organization with uh, sympathetic um, uh, business people. Uh, the, the idea was um, they wanted to give the American people uh, the, the, the notion that Ordinary businesses um, uh, were clamoring for a central bank because um, it would help. It would help ordinary business because there wouldn't be financial panics. Now, the the, the thesis was genuine, one they intellectually believed, and, and I think it was you know uh, basically correct. But but uh, the presentation was manipulative, um, and um, 
some of their handbills, which still exist in their files, I dug them out. They say, they say things like um, uh, adopt our plan uh, to, to avoid, and they use this phrase, dominant centralization. Well, dominant centralization was exactly what they wanted. They wanted a strong central bank, but they were just, you know, they were uh, playing to people's fears of centralization. And um, so this very much helped um, to get business around the country at least aware of the topic. The panic of 1907, it, just as in our own day, when people who wouldn't ordinarily think much about banks or the banking system, the financial system, when you have a panic, they at least have um, a dim awareness that something's wrong and, and they're more open to, um, uh, to reform. Uh, and then um, you know, there were a set of uh, hearings. Uh, you know, it's, Chris, it's just amazing how much hasn't you know, changed. What, what, what do we do when we have a financial panic? A couple of congressmen want to make waves. Uh, they get some big, glaring spotlights. They haul bankers in front of it, and um, you know they they uh, tell the world that that they're coming down hard on these bankers, and, and they have these hearings. And well, that's what happened um, in 1912, called um, the Money Trust hearings. The, the, the trust was a word used back then, basically meant monopoly. And the idea was that there was a money monopoly. Uh, that was the charge, and they had uh, people like J.P. Morgan, people like Stillman, people like Warburg having to testify. And, um, uh, you know, in a pretty unflattering light, obviously, and the, the whole thrust of the hearings was um, that there was a money monopoly, a money trust in the, in the argot of the day, and, and um, really argued that there should be even less centralization after you, know, you have a monopoly, you know, want more of a monopoly. It, it had a curious effect, though. It, the, the money trust hearings didn't lead to any actual legislation one way or the other, but they further um, embedded in people's minds the idea that something in the system was wrong. Uh, you know, just today when we see, um, you know, millionaires or today billionaires uh, being trotted up one after another uh, uh, while everyone else is doing badly, uh, the average person, um, you know, wouldn't have the expertise to, to you know, design a fix, but walks away shaking his head saying, Boy, this system is, is just, you know, is, is just all wrong. Someone's got to fix it. So these hearings that follow the panic, the lobbying, uh, you know, educational work, all got people um, uh, prepared for the idea that the financial system that America had, which, by the way, hadn't changed since the Civil War, when it was a much less dynamic economy, you know, uh, just to be the beginning of the railroad era, when we were now well into the era of the automobile and actually the airplane. Uh, you know, was ready for reform. And what it took was the right political moment. Well, as you mentioned there, people realize, say, for example, today, right, there's these billionaires that are doing great, even in 2008, 2009, so many people out of work. We have the kind of 1%, you know, movement there, Occupy Wall Street. But as it appears, so uh, I don't know the statistics on how many bankers or finance people went to jail during that, but I know it's slim to none. You have the Occupy Wall Street, which basically turned into nothing, I think. Um, does it mean that although the general population recognizes there's issues, we've actually gotten to a point where power is so centralized, there's nothing the average Joe can do about it? It means we've gotten to um, uh, a type of economy, which is um, uh, so concentrated or um, so um, uh, centralized, so uh, uh, susceptible to mass distribution that the winners win uh, in, in a much bigger way. You know, if you have um, an economy, uh, let's take the entertainment industry in the 1910s, where uh, entertainment might consist of a troupe that went from town to town, you know, maybe a, a, a good... Uh, traveling uh, band or circus or whatever would get hired back uh, more frequently. Maybe they could charge more. But, you know, each troop would, you know, they'd go into Wichita, they'd go into Dallas, they'd go into Topeka. And when one was in Topeka, the other would be in Dallas or Cincinnati. They'd, they'd probably earn about the same amount. When you get to the era of uh, radio and you could string together a whole network, then the better performers started making a lot more than the performers that couldn't get on radio or couldn't get on as good a show or show with his uh, high-priced advertisers. When you get now to the era of um, 
electronic distribution of information, uh, the returns for being number one are just astronomical because if you've got a best-selling book, if you've got a best-selling uh, record or song or film, uh, you know, you just, you can grab the whole world's mind share. And that process um, has really sped up uh, in, in lots of ways. You know, a, a top lawyer can go around the world or be around the world uh, in lots of ways. Um, believe it or not, the same process in a different way was going on in the early 1900s. After all, when when um, people today say that, you know, the billionaires today, they're, they'll they frequently say they're like the, the robber barons of, you know, well, this is the period when the real robber barons were, were around, right? And, and what had happened in the early 1900s, the Amer American society had uh, radically changed in a way that, that disturbed people. Change is always disturbing. If, if you traveled, um, you know, through American towns in the 1860s or 70s, most businesses were local. Uh, they didn't have um, national corporations. And in, um, you know, the leading figures in each town might have been, um, uh, might have been the local banker, might have been a local educator, uh, you know, maybe a principal at the school or something. By the 1900s, uh, we had national corporations. We had many more companies listed on the stock exchange, uh, thanks to uh, the telegraph and uh, increasing the telephone and cross-country railroads, uh, communications and, and distribution across the country. And suddenly people didn't know the uh, businesses who they were seeing in their own towns, or they didn't know who owned those businesses. They didn't know what they represented. The railroads, there were very dominant industries by the early 1900s, were controlled in uh, far off cities, you know, typically New York, the West Coast, Chicago. And um, they, they uh, suddenly the, the, the people controlling, who seemed to be running the show uh, in their hometowns, were no longer people in their hometowns, but these uh, distant corporations. So people felt the same sort of marginalization, the same sort of displacement the same sort of shock at um, uh, the rate of change in their world. And, of course, with these big corporations, there were people, uh, the, the people who were successful, the, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, and so on, were getting fabulously rich. And, and it was just as shocking to them and, and um, uh, as it is to us today to see inequality. Wow. Well, we're going to have to have you back on because I really do want to really talk a little bit more about it and, and specifically your book, When Genius Failed. Your newest book, again, America's Bank, The Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve. I mean, it's just a, you know, I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy and go through some of it. And it's just similar to, uh, you know, many of your other bestsellers. You, you have a way of weaving a narrative that's fantastic. Roger, again, thanks so much. Is there anywhere uh, you would like to guide our listeners? I mean, again, we'll link to the book on our website, but I want to see if there was anywhere else out there. Sure. Uh, there's, I have a website, rogerlovenstein.com, which um, uh, tells you all about the book and also about my previous books. And, and it, it also has uh, reviews posted uh, as they come in and, and they're starting to come in and, and uh, they're well worth reading. Perfect. All right, Roger. Thank you again so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. All right. Have a great day. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Roger Lowenstein. His book, America's Bank, The Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve, comes out on Tuesday, October 20th. If you're picking it up on Amazon, don't forget to use the Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast dot com slash amazon it's simply the easiest way to support the show and it comes at no cost to you if this is your first time listening to smart people podcast welcome we are really glad that you're here please don't forget to subscribe to the show in itunes or on your android podcatcher or however else you're getting this show onto one of your devices we do ask that you head over to itunes or stitcher to leave a rating and review over there all of the comments and feedback that you can provide really do help the show. It helps us make the show better, and it also helps us get visibility on the iTunes and Stitcher charts, and that truly is important for the growth of the show. If you'd like to reach out to the show, please shoot us an email at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. 
or send us a message on Twitter at SmartPeoplePod. As always, thank you for joining us this week. Please stick around. We've got some great interviews coming up, and we will see you all next week. Next week.